And thank you very much for joining us. Sure. sure. So sorry for the slight uh, internet uh, in complications. So how are you today? We're doing wonderful. We're very excited to have you today and thank you for joining us. And I was just saying, I want to say thank you very much for all uh, our CEOs joining us from the private sector and all ambassadors and, and everybody in the education uh, sector, universities joining us today in, in, in Rwanda very much for uh, looking for very much for these conversations. Um, uh, Dr. Joe, maybe without taking long, let's jump into this, the, the conversation. I know you're very, very busy. So I'm, I'm very interesting. Um, to jump into the conversation to get a, what's the picture looks like now you know we experienced the, the third wave of this pandemic COVID um, you know can you give us a, a, an overview of the situation on the continent in terms of vaccinations and, and the cases how, how, how we're looking now <clears throat> no sure thank you so much uh, first of all let me um, uh, truly recognize um, the very important work that the Kigali Foreign Affairs Council is doing. I think this is extremely important. And it is what I believe uh, is, is going to be the, uh, uh, the, the future of our continent resides in this kind of, of fora. That is why I, I took upon myself when I saw the invitations and committed myself to be part of this because um, it is okay to be part of the, the, the US Foreign Affairs Council, but we should never, uh, uh, we should always remember where we are coming from yes. and that is supporting you uh, taking part in these things that you organize that uh, we build nations I think this is extremely important and we have a voice in the international uh, uh, arena so I take this uh, truly as an honor for inviting me to be part of this um, uh, conversation and uh, again uh, keep up the good work this is what we need for our continent so let me then go back to COVID. Uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, it's truly a generational uh, challenge, I think, uh, for humanity and for Africa in, in particular. And um, it is going to be, when the history of this is written, and I'm sure it will be written, uh, that it, uh, there will be three parties to history. Uh, those who uh, made this history, and you are part of them, and, and the way we fight it will be remembered as making part of the history those who uh, will write the history. And I'm hoping that uh, people like you will be actively writing history and those who will be reading history. And that is the generations that um, will uh, actually not be part of this, uh, but uh, will remember this from history and then uh, they will read it. And the way uh, history is written is in the manner that by who the uh, victor is. So if uh, you and I fight and then I win you, I write history in my lens. I mean, you are not there to, I mean, so, I say that because I like that uh, organizations like the foreign, uh, uh, the Kigali Foreign Affairs Council uh, take part in making history, but also take part in writing history so that when it's read, it is comprehensive and it is not biased and as to what we, who did what in this. And that is very important in the conversation we are going to have uh, on the, the vaccine front and the other things that we are going. The second thing I'll say, then I go to the more specific, is that <clears throat> this crisis has uh, three big dimensions. It is a serious health crisis that we are facing um, in the last 100 years. Uh, yes, we are dealing with HIV pandemic, but it took us 70 years for 40 million people to be infected with HIV. It's taking us only 18 months for about uh, uh, 200 million people to be infected in the whole world. It's taking us only 18 months for about close to um, uh, uh, 4 million people to die, okay, and on this pandemic there. When, uh, 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 when Ebola hit West Africa and 11,000 Africans died, we said never again. We were all in arms, never again. It was 11,000 in two years. But here we are with about uh, 177,000 Africans who have died. Uh, with about uh, official numbers put us about 7 million Africans infected, which grossly is an underestimate of what the people that have been truly been infected on the continent then. So why am I saying this? Uh, it's, I'm saying this because my fear is that we are beginning to normalize deaths. And people, you hear things, people say that, oh, Africa, only 177,000 people have died. Oh, only uh, 7 million people have been infected in Africa out of a total of uh, 200 million. I mean, I think we should not accept that. One life loss is one too much, especially in a continent that we are struggling to uh, lift up our life expectancy. So where are we with this pandemic in Africa? 
uh, 7 million people officially have been reported to be infected on the continent. Um, 177,000 people have died. And my uh, media source uh, rest in peace. Uh, it is a virus that um, I'll call it in on the continent, we are dealing with uh, an uncertain and unpredictable pandemic. Uh, uh, for, for us because we are uh, for several reasons that we are going to discuss. Uh, we are dealing with a third wave uh, where uh, about 32 member states have actually, uh, are actually going through the third wave and of those 32 countries, um, about 25 of them have actually uh, uh, observed a very severe wave, a, a severe third wave. The definition of a severe third wave is, is the peak of that third wave, the peak of the seven days moving average higher than the, the, uh, the second wave and the answer is yes. I mean, it, I mean, and that means a lot on the, the pressure that it puts on the health system there because of people that have need to go to hospitals and, and, and uh, 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 procure services for HIV, TB, malaria, non-communicable diseases there. So I think that is serious. The second significant thing that we have to note on this pandemic is that um, uh, uh, we, we, we've learned a lot from this pandemic and then uh, science has evolved so quickly and we've learned a lot in terms of the diagnostics just within one month, we're able to uh, develop the diagnostics. And just within one year, we're able to move from understanding the pathogenesis of the virus, sequence it, develop a vaccine, do a clinical trial and start using it. And we celebrated that, but we should be very careful. I'm a virologist for 32 years never say that you know viruses, they, they will surprise you. Otherwise, we would never, we would not be still dealing with HIV for 40 years. Viruses tend to surprise you because they have to survive. So that is why the whole variant thing, as we speak, 24 member states on the continent are now reporting the Delta variant. And that is why it is so aggressive. I think just a few uh, uh, weeks ago, there was no variant on the continent. And yeah. in countries like South Africa, DRC is taking over and, and uh, the whole um, uh, 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 pandemic there. So that is extremely important. We just don't know enough about these uh, variants and we don't know what is going to impact and how it's going to impact vaccine and vaccination uh, programs yeah. across the continent. Yeah. For sure, we, um, I'll say this then, I, I, I'll stop here, that the, the only way we are going to win this battle against um, COVID-19 is if we aggressively uh, roll out vaccination programs on the continent, uh, which unfortunately we are very, very, we are lagging behind so much as a continent of uh, 1.2 billion people. Uh, we have um, actually acquired uh, 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 about uh, close to 100 million doses of vaccines. And then um, with about 70 million people have been vaccinated representing uh, 70 million people of the 100 million that is representing 68% of the supplies, which is our 70%, which is very good, uh, good news, which means that our problem is not about um, uh, vaccine hesitancy. Our problem is about vaccine access. Okay, what yeah. I call the vaccine farming. I yeah. think that is extremely important there. So, but if you put the numbers overall and you see how many people have actually received their two doses of vaccines, it's a less than 2% uh, uh, of people have received that. And our target, if you remember, <clears throat> was to immunize um, up to 60% of our population with uh, oh, sure. complete yeah. doses by the end of 2022. So I think we are extremely uh, worried and, and concerned and rightly so that we are um, lagging behind significantly there. So, so that is the health component of that. The economic dimension of this pandemic is severe. I think never ever did I ever imagine in my 32 years career in, in public health that I will be flying across the continent from airport to airport and I see planes sitting at the tarmac for yeah. on long lines in Ethiopia, in Kigali, in whatever, because around April, we were the only people that were running military planes across, across the continent because we were moving supplies from, we went to the Peace and Security Council of the AU, got authorization and at night while you all were sleeping, we were in the skies running and dropping supplies and responders from capital city to capital. And as you landed in the airport, I see how these planes were standing there. It brought home very clearly that the continent is going to be affected economically seriously. So the economic dimension of this pandemic has been brought home very seriously. And lastly, the security part component of this. Uh, and I want to say this, that, and without mincing my words, that the pandemic is truly a national security threat for our people. See what is happening in Tunisia. I can actually attribute part of what happened in KwaZulu-Natal to 
uh, the issues of the pandemic because people have been under lockdown for so much. They were hungry. Uh, they had no jobs. So when this opportunity happens, they just jump out there. And I mean, and you expect to see that if we continue to go with wave and wave, you expect to see a lot of that, uh, this kind of violence happening there, issues of mental health and, and all the rest. So let me stop there and, and see if I've given you the panoramic view of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, th th there's a few questions you raised already, you know, that I, I want to touch on as we've got the conversation. But actually, just quickly, I want to remind our members, I, I keep seeing people sending me questions. We have almost 700 people. There's no way we could take questions from people. So I apologize in advance where I'm going to get uh, questions from the audience. Uh, but doctor, speaking about writing history, uh, uh, very interesting. At the beginning, Africa was not yet as had at, at the region like Europe uh, and America. And on the overall, the response on the continent was very, very positive. So uh, I'm interested to hear what contributed to this early success, uh, the way we managed the, uh, COVID when started. So, uh, I mean, thank you. That's a very good question, which um, uh, uh, the fora, like the Kigali Foreign Affairs Council, should promote that very well. That is part of the writing of the history, I mean. So let me just uh, try to briefly address this. When the we, we observed what was going on in, 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 in China very carefully in December. I remember <clears throat> in December of 2019, I was on leave and I woke up in the morning and I, I, I called, I wasn't in Addis Ababa, I was outside of Addis. And I woke up, watched the news, and I called uh, the, 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 the CDC uh, Emergency Operations Center and I said, activate the Emergency Operations Center. And they said, this thing is happening in, in Wuhan and you are telling us to activate and we still have an Ebola because the, the, the EOC is the Emergency Operations Center. It's like a command center that we sit there to track what diseases are going on. And if you remember in 2019, Ebola was still raging in North Kivu. So we're still very busy with the emergency. I said, you have to set up a parallel structure, only focus on COVID, okay, at 19. And I was tr truly disputed by my own staff. They said, this thing is too far and whatever uh, in China. And I mean, and it's not even spread out of that area. Then I went further to write a commentary in Nature Medicine, which is one of these big journals in medicine, which I, at that time there were 200 cases of COVID in the world, 200, not 2,000, 200. Yeah. And I warned at that time that Africa needed to be prepared because it was going to hit us, okay? I mean, 200 cases there. That paper exists. You can Google yeah. my name. I see Nature of Medicine, January 27, 2020. That is the date it was published. So when I came back to Addis Ababa, <clears throat> And uh, around early January, we recognized that, um, yes, no country in Africa had been affected, but I knew it was coming. Yeah. So, and then on February 14, the first cases were introduced in, in Egypt. We call a meeting of all ministers of health on the 22nd of February. That is one week later. I remember people coming to my office, my staff coming to me and said, Dr. John, why are you taking a risk? Uh, you're calling a meeting with ministers of health within one week and nobody, no minister is going to come and you are going to look back. I said, I prefer to look back in trying and I prefer to fail in trying than failing to try. And, 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 and uh, uh, guess what happened? 40 ministers came after one week of uh, education. It's never happened. Yeah. Ministers were traveling, like the Minister of Health of Nigeria was traveling in, in uh, Europe, had to cut short his trip, route to uh, Addis Ababa to, to go back. Why is this important to what we are discussing? It's, it, it, it clearly demonstrates how the continent was ready to rally. When they came in for two days, we discussed, we went out and, uh, uh, with a clarity of action, where we, we developed a joint continental strategy. They knew exactly what to do when it, 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 it hits. Because remember Wuhan, what the pictures we were seeing in Wuhan, the China had built a 4,000 uh, bed hospital in two weeks. And I told them that there's no way, even uh, the most advanced economies in Africa that you're going to build at uh, 2,000 beds. So let's, be brutal in, in approaches there. So we agreed on that. We developed a joint continental strategy. And by the, on the 28th uh, of, of February, early March, when the cases started coming in, the countries were doing what we told them. Okay, I mean, if you remember, some countries went into lockdown with two cases. Some yes. countries in a state of emergency with no case. Okay, and whatever. So it helped to blunt it because the way infectious diseases move is that the early actions you take help to blunt it. Okay, I mean, the way it's where if you take South Africa and you plot the graph of the evolution of the early introduction of the virus in South Africa, if South Africa hadn't 
do what we uh, we they, we agreed to do, they would have been at the same level at the UK. Okay, I mean, but I mean, it was it's a very different ball game when it compared to the situation to the UK. So those early, I'll call it bold leadership action uh, and risky. Uh, I mean, and, and come uh, end of March, end of April, the airlines, the, the, the continent had been shut down completely. There, there was no airline traveling in Africa at that time. So I think, um, so I think that is one. Second is the political leadership. President Cyril Ramaphosa was the chair of the African Union. Um, he, we were very blessed that he was chairing the union at that time because I mean, he made this a priority. And then he made sure that it was as evidence and science driven where you call the Africa CDC and put it at the center with the Bureau of the Head of State. The Bureau of the Head of State is made up of 12 presidents, like President Kagame will be there, President Kenyatta. Our, and before he left, I briefed them 15 times on what is it that we're dealing with? What should we be doing? And when you go home, what did you do? So political leadership was so important. Okay, so important because that is what it drove it. So it was not the Minister of Health informing President X or so, it was me directly talking to the president and say, look, this is dangerous. This is what it is there, let's shift them in. And we developed a series of actions there. Okay, which like the PAC initiative, when in March we realized that testing was low, what did we do? We launched the partnership to accelerate COVID testing and advanced testing to 20 million very quickly then. When we realized that commodities were in short supply, we established the African medicine supply platform. It's like the amazon.com. You can go Google yeah. there and there you buy commodities. When we realized that vaccines were not forthcoming, we went, we called them. We called a meeting on the 24th of June and then uh, with 3,000 participants came on board with uh, head of states and we agreed on the strategy, vaccination strategy for the continent and set the target at 60 percent. So that common unity of purpose and action helped a lot, the continent a lot. So I think those are some of the actions that, um, I mean, and then we were never in an issue of disputing whether you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask. And then uh, 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 our previous experiences in fighting uh, the infectious diseases like HIV, TB also have, like the, we deployed 18,000 community workers across the continent to find the cases, okay, where, where they were. So those, all these early actions have to blunt the spread of the, the pandemic across uh, the continent. I mean, it, I certainly that um, the political leadership, the leadership played an, an important role. It was a game changer for Africa's response. So I, I really look forward to see actually, you know, the history recording that the right way. Uh, in case for Rwanda, we saw really the leadership, you know, taking early actions, which we, we managed to, uh, to to manage the cases uh, in, in, in the, this period. So I, I want to come back. You mentioned the vaccinations, which is very interesting. You know, Africa is facing, you know, limited supplies, you know, as rich countries have you know, bought up variable and future doses, which shocking itself, we'll be talking about that later. But how's, uh, you know, your Africa Union and your institution helping African countries uh, navigate this, you know, in, in quality surrounding access to vaccines? You mentioned a little bit, I would love to hear more in details on this. No, no, wonderful. I, I think that, let me start with the good news. The good news is, starting last weekend, uh, through one of those initiatives that was headed by the, the President Ramaphosa when he was chair of the African Union, he created himself what, he, in his capacity as the, the chair of the African Union, the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, the yes, ABAD. Yes, yes. And through that ABAD, we have secured. This is this is not some uh, some uh, public relation announcement that we've secured and signed contracts for 400 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. So in other words, if this was translated into other vaccines, it would be 800 million doses of vaccines. Okay, that, and this is where I would like history to be very, uh, to record it uh, carefully, that it is not donation. It is money that the treasury of our member states has pulled out to buy vaccines because they recognize that it is their own health security that they have to invest in. So this is not donation from some, some, somebody else. That has to be, and that is not spoken enough. I mean, when you talk about vaccine, the first reaction is the COVAX, which is okay. COVAX is all our mechanism, but AVAD is an initiative that they can. And so since this weekend, starting last Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm sure you have been seeing media and tweets on, on that country after country, we are dropping, we are dropping, we are dropping those vaccines there. And this is the first round, we call it the P1, which is the phase one. In the next two weeks, we start again, we're repeating the, the as the production comes up, the vaccines come off the production line, you'll be seeing are dropping, 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 dropping. Our goal is to be sure that all 400 million doses, and, and these are 400 million Africans that will be vaccinated. 
right? These are single doses there. I our see. target is to immunize up to about 60% of our population. That means about 800 and 50 million people or people. So if we can ourselves take our destiny, destiny in our hands and immunize 400 million, then we are only looking for an additional 400 million, right? From, from partners and from, from others there. So that is the, the story that must be told that this is not HIV AIDS or others where we are sitting and waiting for people to come rescue us and whatever there. It, it, it is a defining moment in, uh, in Africa's own uh, uh, trajectory and, and in its own uh, projection of self-determination. Self-determination is not just about a country X and Y going to war so that, or a region of a country trying to express, but it's also self-determination in saying, 177,000 people have, of our people have died. Our economies have been shattered. We have to do something and we did something there. So that is clear. I say I started with that storyline because um, I, I wanted uh, um, not to dwell so much in the narrative of uh, countries that are holding so much vaccines and not giving us and whatever. I don't want us to be what I describe as Africa to continue to be that uh, the, 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 the sky in the moral conscience of, of the world all the time when these things happen. I want us to say that we are determined to be people, okay? And people of 1.2 billion people, we know what to do. We have the, 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 the brains to do it. We may not have access, but we'll continue to fight. And it's a position that we have taken and we are not retreating from that position. I mean, the position of we can do it and we can do it just as others are doing, are doing it. And Avat needs to go down in the history of, of when the history of this pandemic is written carefully then. So I think, uh, uh, have we been fairly treated by global solidarity and cooperation? No, I mean, clearly COVAX said, don't bother, go home, relax. We're going to give you vaccines about 25% of vaccines will come, it will be equal access, timely access and whatever. Has that uh, been the case? No, and this is not a criticism. The people running COVAX are all my friends. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, that is, but it's a reality. You as a, a civil society, if you turn to me as your public health leader and you say, John, where are the vaccines? What did you do? I, as I can see, well, I was counting on COVAX and COVAX uh, said where well, they told us that India was uh, burning and they couldn't, do it. that doesn't solve your problem. Okay, you know what I mean? It doesn't solve your problem. I mean, what, the answer you want to hear from me is that I did A, B, C, D and to protect you and you are protected. Whether we're well, India, that we, we get a lot of money, but uh, you know, you saw what happened in India, and it doesn't give you the vaccine in your arm. So I think we should be uh, acknowledge that while celebrating our own success, acknowledge the failures that the global system Im uh, uh, impacted on us. Yes, I mean, the global system, we, we could talk about that, it, it, it will take two hours. Um, I, I want to touch about, you, you mentioned a little bit, I want to touch about uh, production vaccines in Africa, on the continent. One, there's a question of you know what the African Union CDC is, is, is doing to support the countries you know to increase production and actually start the production of vaccines moving forward. And second, how do we end up actually in this situation without even being able to produce you know vaccines? You know, there, there's um, when you look at uh, uh, the the way that the world has been structured. Mm -hmm. and uh, especially in, in health security. Uh, it was structured after 1947 so that it, it created dependency. I mean, very, very strong dependency. This was even before many countries in Africa got independence. And then it, that, that whole system of what I call the post-1947 arrangement has been sustained. So if you look at, forget about COVID for one second and look at ordinary vaccines. The vaccines that you and I have taken as, 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 as kids growing up and whatever are vaccines that are bought solely by the Gavi, the Global uh, uh, Vaccine Alliance in Geneva. So what do they do? They essentially say, well, they get money from rich countries and from philanthropic organizations like the Gates Foundation. I'll take the money, I'll go to India and then find a vaccine manufacturer there, give it, give that, uh, and China, give them the money, they manufacture cheap, 
They'll give me the vaccine, then I'll send it to Africa. So Africa, don't bother. Just you can consume the vaccine. What are you, uh, I mean, the most important thing for you, uh, African, to know is that my child needs a vaccine. I go get it uh, to the, the Kigali Reference Hospital and get my vaccine. So what? Uh, so that state of affairs kept us in that de dependency mode there. So it very clearly, um, uh, uh, we it never thought of, I mean, how do we do things for ourselves? Because that is how we were shaped. And we were, I mean, it's like the way you raise your kids. That's how they know that if I need water, I go open the fridge and I get a bottle of water and I drink. I never ask the question of where is this water coming from? And then as far as I drink it, I'm thirsty, I'm free, I, I move on there. So that is dangerous. We import 99% of our vaccines in Africa, a continent of 1.2 billion people. We produce 1% of those vaccines. Diagnostics, we import 100% of diagnostics. So let me not just limit it to vaccines there. So I think it's, I mean, import about 95% of our therapeutics, okay? Those are the three commodities for health security of a people. If a people need to uh, uh, guarantee their health security, they have to be able to be in control of those uh, 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 elements there. And it's not a zero-sum game. It's not a zero-sum game, which means if um, Africa produces, China or India loses, there. it cannot be that. I mean, it's the people. Before, when the, the current structures that are in place, the global health security structures that are in place, the WHO, the UNICEF and others were put in place, we were 250 million people by 1947. That is from Cairo to Cape Town, from Mogadishu to Dakar in Senegal. Today, we are 1.2 billion people, but we are still being governed by the same architecture that was put in place about 75 years ago. It's like a house that you have in Kigali 75 years ago, even though you have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you are still using the same house to, to, to manage that. It's not, it's not a criticism to anybody, but it's just a fair as a, a understanding that we need to relook at that, rethink into those uh, systems so that you allow regions to, uh, in, to serve, aspire, and to take certain things into their own hands there. So that is what we are trying to change. As we speak, five countries in Africa before COVID-19 were producing vaccines. And of, of all of those, only the Institute Pasteur in Senegal were producing vaccines that were bought by Gavi, that the global vaccine, has, I mean, and that is just the yellow fever vaccines, okay? So Senegal, South Africa, uh, Egypt, I believe Morocco and Tunisia were producing some kind of vaccine, and most of them were filled and finished, which is essentially, you take a... Uh, vaccines from somewhere that has been produced that you put it into a bottle in the region then you can use it distribute it uh, locally there but in terms of really conceiving it developing it and then producing it the whole from start to end it was very limited and it's still very very limited but i'm hopeful that the situation is changing because as we speak now you know that senegal is in the next few months will be producing vaccines whether it's feel feel and finish or not there will be south africa uh, they already has two agreement arrangements that they will be doing that with Pfizer and there's a manufacturing hub that we are part of that. In Kigali itself, I mean, we are working uh, very uh, closely with the, the, the government of, of Rwanda to see what we can do there. Uganda, um, uh, Egypt has started, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria. So the, the way we fight the next pandemic will be very different from the way we are fighting this pandemic. So we have two minutes left, so, and I have, still have a lot of questions. But then my last question is this, maybe I can come back. These two questions, you just mentioned this. How do we strength uh, the <clears throat> health capacity of Africa so we can continue to be better prepared for the next pandemic? And I will uh, combine with this question, what should, uh, you know, what else can we learn from COVID-19 crisis? I, I think the, the, the key lesson, given the time constraint we have that we learned from COVID-19 uh, crisis is that we are more vulnerable than we thought, regardless of where you are, whether you are in the global south or not, or very vulnerable. Secondly, is that we are more connected than we thought. Remember that December 2019, you and I were watching this on TV. It was in a place called, I didn't even know where Wuhan was. That's a search and found Wuhan. And, and then here we are with it, uh, uh, myself being infected now. I'm managing a COVID infection now from home. Um, thirdly is that the inequalities that uh, we thought existed are even broader. Inequality within a country, inequality between countries, inequality between regions. 
inequalities between the different geopolitics of the world, the North South. Uh, I mean, it's just, I mean, and unless and until uh, we, we begin to narrow those fault lines, it will become very difficult. So, where do we go from here? There are five things the continent must do, put in place to, uh, to address, to prepare itself, uh, what I call building back better, bolder, and, and bigger. One is you all, we all have to have our own national public health institution. <clears throat> <clears throat> that would be the equivalent of having your own that saying that each country have a military barrack and soldiers that are ready to go out and fight quickly so they don't wait until the enemy is in there i mean like the rwanda uh, biomedical uh, uh, center is an example of that kind of a response unit that you want to see uh, people and the response unit is maintained by fighting ordinary diseases that are out there every day uh, challenging you you, you heard about the Marburg uh, uh, virus outbreak in Guinea. So, they, I mean, they, they are not giving us time, right, to finish this battle before you do that. So, strengthening national public health institutions across the continent uh, with a, a very strong Africa CDC that coordinates that is key. Second, you and I discussed manufacturing of uh, 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 di diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, in the, 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 the health security commodities on the continent. Third is workforce. Regardless of what I mean, we are saying whether you're strengthening your national public health institutes or you're strengthening your manufacturing, it's human beings, human capital at the center of that. Young people like you need to be trained how to develop R and D. I hear a lot about uh, uh, transfer of technology. I mean, and and, and and patents. And I've cautioned that be careful that we do not create another stigmatization that somebody like you and I will sit in the south and say, well, I'm waiting for some young people in Korea to develop that technology and transfer it to me. I mean, we can, we should really talk of co-creating technology, giving people the, the, uh, the opportunity wherever they are in Africa to create uh, the, for R&D so that we can be innovative there so that we, this idea is another dependency thing we have just pre preaching about. Yes, it's okay for now to talk about transfer the technology, but let's talk about co-creating technology, empowering young people to do that. Third is working with the private sector. Fourth, sorry, is working with the private sector. We must work with the private sector very strongly so that innovation, the kind of successes we have seen in this pandemic is because we work with the private sector. People like Strive Masiwa, people like uh, Don, uh, Dr. Donna Kabaruka and others that are coming in and bringing in different dimensions to solving the public health problem, which has become an economic a security and a health issue across the continent. And lastly is what I call um, a respectful partnership. Okay, where our partners don't come in to do what they think is good for us. They come in to respect what we, we have mapped for ourselves and then work with us, embed their vision within our vision so that we can, we can get to where we want to go so rather than coming in with a solution for us. I mean, it's very difficult to sit in, in a capital city in a developed world, you fly in here and you tell me what exactly I should be doing in Ethiopia. I think that is one of the errors that we have tried to make, which I call uh, in trying to help me, you are, you, are, you are destroying me. So I think those are some of the five things that we must do to prepare for the next pandemic. Dr. John, on behalf of every African, thank you for your service and thank you for the work you're doing. Your, your work is saving a lot of lives around the continent. So we want to say thank you very much. And please, thanks for giving us your time and engaging us and, you know, help, help us understand what's happening on our continent. And we appreciate your leadership and, and your work. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. And feel better, please. I know you had COVID, so, you know, I'll recover soon. And, and, and thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to hosting one. This was your very short. So next time we come to one, we'll, we'll sit and we we'll hope we'll have won the fight with COVID and we'll re engage in conversation like the lessons uh, and run that history, as you said. Yeah, good. Keep up the good work. And uh, thank you I, I look forward to seeing you one day in person. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Your excellence and everybody. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye.